Well, good evening and welcome to this lecture for the Herschel Society and the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. The title is A Tour of the Dynamic Universe and the lecturer is Dr. Jeff Scargill. And good morning to you, uh, Jeff, in California. Good morning, or good evening. My name is Tony Symes. I organize the lectures for the Herschel Society. And uh, I've got someone else to be admitted here. Oh, he's all right, he's in. As, as always, I need to remind you about lecture etiquette. So please check the right through the lecture, you stay on mute and your video off, please. Uh, you can turn your microphone and video back on for the Q&A session afterwards. Also, um, please be aware that this lecture is being recorded. Now for questions, uh, we've got a, an audience in the room and a remote audience. Uh, when it comes to the Q&A session, I'll take uh, questions either from the room or from the remote audience but if you're remote please put your questions in the chat channel um, we simply won't see you if you uh, use hand raising or other reactions um, you must um, put the question into the chat channel and we'll deal with the questions pretty much on a first come first serve basis at the end so this lecture is a is a new combination for us it's the first one where we have a a physical audience in the BRSI and a remote lecturer being uh, projected in the room, as well as a remote audience. We've done our best with uh, uh, the available technology to ensure that everyone can hear properly, but we are learning all the time. So I, I hope very much that we've got it right this time. Now the next lecture for the Herschel Society and the BRSI will be on Friday the 4th of March, exactly four weeks from today, it will be given in person at the BRLSI by Martin Ward, who's the Emeritus Temple Chevalier Professor of Astronomy at Durham University. And it will have the title, The James Webb, The Next Generation of Hubble Telescope. Back to tonight's lecture, Dr. Jeffrey Scargill uh, graduated with BA summa cum laude from Pomona College in California, got his PhD at the California Institute of Technology. Recently retired from the NASA Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, California, where he was a research astrophysicist in the Planetary Systems Branch, Astrobiology and Space Science Division. Jeff studied high energy astrophysics using data from the NASA Great Observatories especially in the X-ray and gamma-ray spectrum. He has pioneered the development of statistical and data analysis for analysis of astrophysical time series images and other data. Let me hand you over to Jeff. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tony. And let me um, make sure I have everything right here. Okay, I hope you can see the first slide, the introductory slide, and hear me okay? Is everything good? It's good in the room. We can see the slide and we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, it, um, it's a great honor to be able to do this. I only wish I could do it in person and visit uh, Bath. Um, I want to begin by thanking especially Jeff Briggs, who um, suggested that I give this talk. Jeff Jeff and I were colleagues for, for many years when he was um, back at in NASA and, and NASA Ames and so on, and also Tony and and Bob for their help in the logistics for this um, this presentation. There's we have several backups for for backups as in the usual NASA fashion. So what I want to talk about today is is kind of the transition from an earlier view of the astronomical universe, which I like to call the clockwork universe for reasons that I, I think you'll see as we go along, to a, a more modern view of, of the universe, the dynamic universe, hence the, the title of the talk. Uh, it wasn't a, a sudden transition, at, um, depending on how you, you think of time scales, but there were some hints of uh, sand in the gears of the clock um, along the way. But basically over the last century or so, there's been a dramatic transition from a, a kind of a, an old-fashioned, simple view of the universe 
to one that's um, very much more uh, energetic and, and dynamic. And, th and that's what I want you to take away is to, um, to, to see illustrations of, of that transition. So the clockwork universe, uh, I don't necessarily want to endorse this book. This is the title page of a book, which I haven't read. Uh, it's gotten good reviews, I think, but it's, um, I, I think maybe it's one of the um, uh, initial coining of the term, the clockwork universe. But, and it's a simple idea that for, for almost the entire history of astronomy until, like I say, the last century or so, um, the, the universe seemed like a very calm and serene place, a very um, methodical place where everything was moving um, regularly in, in, um, along their, their paths, planets in their orbits, as we, we now know. Um, there have been changes in how the things are laid out and in, in, our, in our vision, starting from the old um, Earth-centric views, um, uh, eventually reaching the modern view of uh, planets and the Earth moving around the sun. But in, in all that change, the basic notion that the universe was like a regular clock and things were not um, changing rapidly um, really held sway over, over that whole time. Uh, my first introduction to the, the clockwork universe, so to speak, was back when I was a, a child in, in the Chicago area where I grew up. This is the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, um, where my parents took me to a planetarium show where, where I first got interested in astronomy and uh, ended up making my own telescope in the optical shop in the basement of the um, planetarium. And I still remember see, sitting in the planetarium shows. Um, and this is a, a picture of this old Zeiss planetarium uh, device. The uh, planetarium is um, the word applies to the projection device as well as to the museum itself. And he hearing wonderful planetarium shows, uh, which showed the, um, the, the motions of the stars and the planets accelerated from real time, of course, but still in a very um, almost musical uh, way with a cadence and a, and a, um, and a, and a slow um, motion that was kind of enhanced by background of classical music and, and so on. In the, in the museum, um, um, the, the, this, the other planetarium has a wonderful collection of ancient instruments, including the instrument shown in the upper right. Uh, some of you may recognize this as um, uh, Herschel's uh, telescope and the, the picture of Herschel in the center, um, carrying coals to, to Bath, I guess, at, at this point. But I was told when I was at the planetarium and hung around and, and joined the astronomy club there and everything, that this was the original telescope that, that um, Herschel discovered the planet Uranus with. Um, Tony has informed me that there were a lot of copies and that um, it's sort of unknown uh, which one is the original telescope. But I, I like to think that I actually held in my hands, which I did this telescope and that maybe it was the original discovery telescope. But uh, in any case, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting connection uh, to the to today's talk. Um, another connection that I, I just realized, I, I hope you'll, uh, forgive a few personal things to, to start with. I, um, a, a, the wife of a colleague of mine at, at Ames, um, Sharon Sitlow, is an actress and playwright. And a number of years ago, she wrote a, a play called uh, Dead Women, Including Cleopatra. Um, and I attended a performance of the play. And one of the scenes is a, a monologue uh, spoken by Caroline Herschel. And um, here is a, a segment of that monologue. I don't expect you to read it. I just wanted to show you that this, this exists along with some stage directions and so on. Um, I understand that there's considerable interest in, in, in Caroline Herschel. And if anybody wants a, um, a, a full copy of this monologue, um, I'll make that available to, uh, to Tony and um, you, you may find it interesting. And I, I would like to know that of course, this is a, it's a, um, dramatization, uh, Sharon did qu quite a bit of research and I hope the, um, the things in it are, are 
authentic and so on, but I, um, I, it would be interesting to know how, uh, how authentic some of you who may know much more about um, Carolyn Herschel's um, career uh, think of this. Um, so I'm, uh, here's another, um, turning now to more, more uh, contemporary science. Here is, um, an, I, I consider this an example of the clockwork universe. The, uh, in the upper left, you see a, an image, a Voyager image from the Voyager uh, satellite, um, Voyager spacecraft that NASA sent out to take close images of the planet Saturn. And what you see is the, um, the dark uh, band across the image is the, the so-called Enki division or the Enki gap in Saturn's rings. There are a number of gaps. You can see other gaps in this image, but it's focused on the Enki divisions. And you, you can even see a, um, a, um, the, the trace of a, um, a ring in the middle of the gap. Um, and if you look at it carefully, th this is actually a, a um, kind of an odd picture. It shows an actual photograph held at an angle to s sort of uh, enhance the effect that the, especially on the right-hand edge of the uh, gap, you see kind of a wavy pattern. Um, Jeff Cuzzy, my a colleague at, at Ames, at, supposedly sitting in an airport waiting for a plane, happened to be playing with some of these pictures and looked at it from an angle and noticed this, this wavy edge to the gap. In the upper right, you see a, a better picture of that where the, the waviness of the edge is, is more apparent. And at the lower left is a, a, a graphs which um, were based on scans, so-called uh, photometric scans where you, you uh, measure the brightness of the uh, photographic image as a function of position along along the um, the gap, and especially in the top plot, you see a very distinct periodic wavy pattern as a function of the of the longitude around the um, uh, around the gap. And by analyzing this, um, doing Fourier analysis and so on, Jeff, Jeff Cousy and I were able to to uh, make the following prediction: the the, the underlying physical idea was that a, a wavy edge like this could be um, due to the gravitational influence of a unseen satellite moving within the, the gap, an unseen object um, that through various dynamical processes, but mainly gra gravity um, generates a, a wave-like disturbance along the uh, edges of the gap. And in fact, by doing the analysis carefully, we were able to not only um, verify that this made sense physically, but we could predict where in the gap at a particular time the satellite would be. And in fact, it was discovered, uh, Mark Showalter, a colleague of ours, uh, by carefully inspecting images at the right time. And it's kind of hard to see in the, except in the, the inset at the upper right, you see a little dot, which is actually a, a, a satellite called PAN, it was named PAN. And I, I like to think of this as the, after the discovery of uh, Neptune based on the gravitational influence of Neptune on the or orbit of the planet Uranus, this was the next in line where an, a new object in the universe was discovered based on the prediction um, and again, and uh, in turn, based on the, the um, perturbation of the um, of, of some object due to gravitational influence. So it's like a um, a, a not a mirror image exactly, but it's up at the top. I have this sort of uh, logical um, that the discovery of the satellite pan was uh, was a similar um, phenomenon. So. But but again, this is not, we're not seeing any rapid changes or any dramatic dynamic things. This is still the clockwork universe. Here's another example of the the simple uh, straight line motions of um, objects. This is a an image of the sky taken by a, a, a NASA satellite called TESS. Uh, TESS is a, a kind of follow-on to the Kepler satellite, which is a planetary detection 
satellite, uh, primarily meant to detect uh, exosolar planets, that is planets orbiting stars other than the sun. And many of you know that's been a fantastically successful um, uh, project and TESS is following on Kep Kepler and finding more and more things. But in addition, um, TESS images the sky in such a way that you can see a, a lot of things. Um, th these, the, these linear motions you see here are basically uh, asteroids and you can see kind of groups of asteroids moving together and so on. It's almost like a time-lapse uh, image. Of, uh, but e even more interesting is a, a way of showing uh, changes and motions by doing a subtraction. This is a, a, a little bit hard to describe in just a few words, but what is done is to subtract one image in the movie, so to speak, the test generates from the next image so that anything that doesn't uh, change brightness or move, uh, it simply cancels out. So when I, when I start the video uh, moving, you'll see a few things that you should ignore. You, you'll see some, like some of these um, uh, white things moving across now are just artifacts of the way that the camera is working and so on. But what you, what you see that is real is, is motions of these, um, of, of some of this, uh, you can see things that are moving, which are asteroids, but you can also see stars and let me stop the, the video for a second. What the deal here is that um, in these different images, you can see the changing brightness of variable stars. So this, this circle is, is around a, a, a known variable star and the, the data analysis scheme that was cooked up for this generates the light curve of the star. So you can see the test not only follows um, asteroids and comets and uh, tracks variable star brightnesses and also finds planets around other stars. So it's a, it's a remarkable satellite. Um, but again, this is still clockwork in, in these variable stars, you see the ticking tickings of clocks and, and so on. So um, now let's, let's see how things started to break down, how there was some, like I said in the, introduction, there was some sand in the in the clockwork mechanism, so to speak. Uh, the next uh, few slides is I'm going to show um, so some indications of, of the breakdown of this simple, serene view of the universe. And I have this, it's not exactly a warning, but I, in, in case I for, forget to explain, I'm, I'm going to show a lot of things that are called time series plots, where they're graphs of some something as a function of time. Uh, typically, the brightness of something as a function of time. This happens to be a, a gamma ray burst, which I'll talk about a bit later. But um, so, so keep in mind that um, the, the, a typical way of, of showing how things are changing suddenly and dramatically in the universe is to make a plot of how things change with time. Well, one of the, this is an early indication that things dramatic things could happen. This is a um, so a, a sort of a, a artist, artist representation of a ch Chinese astrologer uh, viewing a supernova. In the year 1054, there was a, a bright supernova uh, that was reported in China and Korea, I believe, but, but actually not in, not in Europe or, or in the United States, for the, uh, essentially for the most part, which is kind of an interesting uh, thing because it was such a bright supernova um, that it, it would have been impossible to miss. Anybody looking at the sky at all um, would see this bright, um, bright new star. It was bright enough so that it was visible by uh, even during the day for s several weeks and at night you could read a newspaper by it. So um, we are told. And um, anyway, this event, this, this no, supernova, an exploding star, is an example of a dramatic uh, dynamic change in the universe, which has consequences. One of the consequences is le left over after the star explodes. It leaves behind a, a remnant, a, an expanding um, 
a blob of gas and and um, and lots of other interesting things. This is a, a an image, a historical image, of this of the uh, remainder of this supernova from the year 1054, as seen um, uh, hundreds of years later by the Earl of Ross, and uh, it's a famous picture which probably uh, gave rise to the the name the Crab Nebula but it doesn't look really that much like a modern uh, picture of the Crab Nebula. Here is a, a more modern picture of the Crab Nebula, which some of you who are familiar with this object may look at this as being a little different from the normal image. Um, this is a, an image through special filters that only allow uh, certain kinds of radiation through. This is showing radiation from high energy particles that are emitting what's called synchrotron radiation. It's a, a very special kind of radiation that comes from uh, relativistic particles in magnetic fields. And I, I won't go into a lot of the details, but it's a, a very spectacular uh, proof that there's a huge amounts of energy expanding away from the center of the, um, this, um, what's left over of this, um, remnant of an explosion from the year 1054 and is in the in the 500 or so years since then has um um or sorry more more than that. anyway in the in the long time since then has expanded to a much larger thing well i as part of my my phd thesis i studied this object and tried to measure uh, motions of the um of the of things near the center and here's of kind of a fanciful graph I made where I, I measured the position of some of the features on the previous um, uh, photograph as a function of time. The horizontal axis is time and years um, starting back. Um, these are all based on photographs from, from the uh, 200 inch Hale telescope. And, and I tried to piece together the motions of these objects, which is kind of like a movie that's not not regular because the the pictures were not taken at a you know once every week or every month. They were just kind of randomly taken when the um, observers at at Palomar decided to take them. And so it was like a movie with interruptions. And I tried to to picture um, that maybe this um, this feature near very near the center was moving in and out. It, it, when I measured it, it seemed to move in and out, and this seemed to be be tracking it. And um, Another way of looking at, at changes in the in this nebula is to do something a little bit like the uh, Tess uh, subtraction movie that I showed. Uh, that is to try to subtract out any uh, any um, feature of the nebula that isn't moving. And the way I did this was to sandwich together a negative of a a picture. Uh, of the um, crab nebula taken at one time from a from with a positive of an image taken at a different time. So positive being black and, and negative being white, uh, so to speak. So that if something had not changed, the black and white would cancel each other out. And so these these are called composite um, photographs, uh, especially the one in the on the top right shows this field of motions within the uh, Within the nebula, and um, I learned this um, technique from from Fritz Zwicky, from Fritz Zwicky, a famous astronomer who um, used this technique in, in a lot of other situations. So it's kind of a cl clever way that Zwicky found for um, back in the days before computers, where you could do image subtraction by computers. So, so anyway, it, um, it was stunning when I first saw this movie. This is a movie, a NASA movie take um, based on observations from the from an X-ray telescope, from the Chandra X-ray telescope. And it's it's a movie with high resolution showing that central region. Let me let me go back, showing this this central region um, with a different orientation and so on and 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 kind of zooming in. And kind of it, this verified this this notion that I, I had that the there were things moving in and out and generating waves that that propagate out into the nebula. These waves are have a fantastic amount of energy in them. They're 
highly dynamic situations, uh, they move at roughly the th one third of the speed of light. So uh, this movie takes place over, or, over about a year or so. And, and so you see things moving um, at a very rapid, um, very rapid um, pace. And even more surprising was that the, this Crab Nebula, which um, seemed to be pretty um, uh, constant in brightness. Uh, in fact, the, some of you have followed um, uh, space astronomy. Every time a new wavelength region was opened up by launching a, a, a satellite into space in the um, infrared and ultraviolet and, and um, X-ray and gamma ray and, and so on to new wavelength regions where you couldn't observe from the from the ground because of the Earth's atmosphere. Almost the, always the first object uh, seen was the Crab Nebula because it's so bright and nearby and so on. But it's also seemed to be constant in brightness, so that it was used as a standard candle. It was used to calibrate the instruments and so on. But Surprisingly, um, the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, after collecting data for, for a number of years, showed that that wasn't the case, that this seemingly um, constant object was a actually a, a rapid uh, variable in, uh, in gamma rays. The, the top plot is one of those graphs I mentioned showing as a function of time, the gamma ray flux, the, the gamma ray emission coming from the, the Crab Nebula. And think of gamma rays as just like ordinary light, um, red, green, blue, whatever light, same thing as radio waves or X-rays, but with very much higher energy. The, the energy is, is 10,000 times the energy in, an, in X-ray radiation. So it's very powerful radiation. And what you see in this plot is um, what are called flares that over a constant background of, of of, of what's called flickering or, or random changes, some of which is observational errors, but much of this variation is real variation in the, in the uh, gamma ray emission of the Crab Nebula. You see um, intervals of time of a few days or weeks where there's a sudden brightening, especially near the end of this plot, there's a, a big um, complex feature um, which in the in the actually if you go all the way to the bottom plot, it's sort of a zooming in on uh, that feature, showing that it's composed of uh, several um, spikes, and it's so it's not just one outburst; it's it's like a repeating explosion of some kind. The um, I, I won't go in, into details about the kind of analysis that that I, I did on this plot. The the red um, the red lines, and especially in the, the middle plot, are a result of an analysis technique that tries to differentiate the real signal from the background, um, uh, the background uh, um, constant signal that's just due to um, observational errors. And so the, these um, long red bars are where the analysis method says nothing is changing, but where there's a, a um, an increase in the in the height of the bar, it says there's a significant uh, variation there, which your eye may not see because of the noise. But anyway, it showed very highly um, significant uh, spikes near the near the end of this this observation. So, to me, this was a um, a stunning discovery, and it was particularly meaningful in terms of of a sort of something that I had started my career on decades ago coming back to haunt me in a sense, but by um, providing yet a new surprise that um, surprised a lot of people that there was this stunning uh, outburst of, of, of this high energy radiation. And I must say that, that it, the, there is no real um, physical explanation that's agreed upon for how this radiation is produced, why there, why there are these, these flares and these spikes. There are various um, uh, theoretical ideas involving high energy particles in, in strong magnetic fields, but it's, it's, it's quite a bit of, of a puzzle. 
Okay, well, so now we're, those are sort of hints that are things that were um, pretty dramatic, but more, more yet to come. And um, it, it's, it's pretty well known that, that uh, our view of the universe has changed in a number of ways over the last, let's say 20 or 30 years, especially um, in terms of broad uh, aspects, the origin of the universe. We now, we now know that the um, beginning of the universe as such is not just a philosophical idea that anybody can postulate anything they want to about it. It's something that we can pin down. We have observations from the so-called cosmic background uh, radiation that tell us a lot about uh, the origin of the universe. We now know um, to a, a percent or so um, how old the universe is and, and how it began and how it's expanding and, and so on. Um, also, the, our notion of what the universe consists of, the matter in the universe has dramatically changed. There's the so-called uh, dark energy and dark matter components that have been discovered. And the, what we used to think was the, the total amount of matter in the universe, uh, atoms of the kind that make up um, stars and planets and, and refrigerators and everything we, we know about in ordinary life, that's only a small fraction of roughly 5% of the constituency of the universe. And we now know that there are singularities, there are black holes um, that you know what, uh, one could talk about um, a, a lot in terms of details, and I'll, I'll show some of that uh, from the dynamical point of view, but there are these singularities which are, are stunning things. So, but in addition, among all these, these stunning advances of, of modern astrophysics, uh, one that doesn't get mentioned or singled out as, as often as I think it should, but uh, that's my bias, because as you have seen from the beginning of my career, I've, I've been interested in, in ch things changing and things exploding and, and so on. Um, the, the, dy the aspects that I call a dynamic universe is, is less um, talked about in newspaper headlines and so on, but it's, it's really as big an advance, in, in my opinion, as these these advances about um, our knowledge of the where we came from, the origin of the universe, the content. And I, I probably should have here something about life in the universe and and exoplanets and so on, but that that's a whole nother uh, whole nother subject. Um, so sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of take you on the the rest of the tour of the so-called dynamic universe, and we don't have to go too far to start. This is um, at home on the earth. Obviously this is a map of the earth showing um, positions and extents of things called large igneous provinces or, or lips. Uh, this is something I'd never even heard of until some colleagues um, asked me to help them with um, analyzing the, the timing of these things. But they are these are monumental events that happen, have happened over the, the um, history um, of the earth um, millions and, and billions of years in, in, the, in the past um, and essentially have, I guess you could, the best way to think of them uh, is um, huge volcanic eruptions that make a simple volcano um, pale in comparison. These, as you can see, cover uh, large areas of the earth with um, magma and, and, and so on. Um, some of it doesn't get to all the way to the surface, but anyway, these are monumental explosive, explosive <clears throat> events. And um, our, our study was based on, on timing, uh, on, from the fact that the, the ages of these various events, the numbers you see written on the map, uh, 201 million MA stands for million years. So the, these are the ages when these things occurred and they appear to have occurred randomly over time. They weren't clustered in time. There weren't eras when they were more common or less common. And we wanted to see to what extent, since they are random, uh, just by accident, two of them could occur at the same time. And would that cause catastrophic um, uh, influences on the earth? And also um, 
the extrapolation to the planet Venus, where we were wondering, what, is it possible that the same thing could have been happening on the planet Venus? And that um, that's an interesting study in its own right. But so anyway, like I say, the dynamic universe is, is, is not far away necessarily, it's right nearby. Moving out through the solar system, this is, of course is the planet Jupiter and um, what the, the dynamic aspect that I don't think was anybody predicted ahead of um, NASA uncovering it um, with a, um, from a space uh, observation was that there is a aurora um, at the North Pole of, um, of, of uh, Jupiter. And this is a movie showing how, how the, some of what you see is the, the uh, kind of a rotation of the system, but you see flashing of um, almost like a lightning aspect to the um, what's generating the aurora. Um, moving further out, I, I like to show this just to re remind myself and, and, and everybody, uh, don't forget that we are embedded in a galaxy. This is a, a view uh, showing an observatory in the foreground. I, um, I forget where this is, I think it's in Hawaii, but it doesn't matter, which shows the, the Milky Way and this, this wonderful galaxy that we're one little star in. And um, we're just learning a whole lot about um, the galaxy that we live in, in particular, what's going on at the center of our galaxy. And one of the most stunning discoveries of the last 20 or 30 years is that our galaxy has a black hole at the, at the center of it. And here is a... Um, a, a movie, I'm going to sh uh, show a movie in a minute, showing the motions of stars near the, um, the center of our galaxy. This cartoon star is just a positional mark for where the center of our galaxy is. And these, these other um, circles are the positions of stars very near the center of, of our galaxy. The angular scale is indicated here. This is a quarter of a second of arc. So this is a very tiny, um, uh, image of the um, uh, a, a tiny uh, fragment of the area around the um, the center of our galaxy, and this is um, data collected over uh, tens of years at by the group at um, UCLA using the Keck Observatory. And keep your eye on this star here marked SO2 because you'll see that that's one of the stars that moves uh, most dramatically. So what what we'll see in this movie is the, the motions of the stars um, around this, this center. And it's clear that it's, the stars are not moving at random, they're moving in orbits. At least some of them are moving in orbits and clearly well-defined elliptical orbits, just like planets around the sun. <clears throat> but what are they orbiting around? They're orbiting around an unseen massive object. And um, by, calculating how what the mass is based on Newton's law of gravity and so on, you can figure out uh, how massive the, um, the object is. And it's around a million uh, solar masses. It, it has to be a black hole um, because you can't, there's, there's no, other, no other object that could produce um, the gravitational influence that you see. And yet there's nothing to see there. It can't be a a cluster of stars or anything like that. It has to be something that's dark, that's not emitting any light and um, has the mass of a million uh, suns. And we saw this star at SO2 came very close to the black, uh, the black hole. And at one point it was thought it might, uh, might be gobbled up by the black hole. In fact, let me just run the movie again so you can get a feeling for it. Here it is. And it was, it was known well ahead of time that it, its projected orbit brought it closer to the center than any of the other stars and it came very close, but didn't disappear. It could have been gobbled up, so to speak. It could have fallen into the gravitational potential, but, and it actually is now has made uh, several orbits around the black hole and it's not uh, collided with it. So to me, this was the first uh, proof um, that was almost unavoidable that black holes exist. There were, before this, there were ideas and there were various X-ray um, 
objects that could be explained by black holes um, with gas falling into them and so on. But um, it was never um, the smoking gun, so to speak. And this, to me, was the first really uh, absolute proof that it, black holes exist. I, I'm going to show another. Here's an, another um, similar mo movie, but it, um, it it's kind of the same from the same data, more or less. But it it kind of shows more dramatically um, this field of stars moving around this one this um, this center of our galaxy with this fantastic black hole. And it also, at the end, I uh, hope I can pause it. Uh, um, let me go back. The, the end of it, which is not wanting to pause, but it, it's a three-dimensional um, three dimensional view. It turns out we can not only track the orbits of these stars in the plane of the sky, we can uh, track their orbits in three three dimensional space. So you get a feeling for these these stars moving in a, a almost like a a star cluster around the um, the center of our galaxy. Um, moving out even further, this is data from the Kepler satellite, which I mentioned before, which is a the um, the, the main planetary detection. Um, program at NASA was based on the Kepler Observatory and had this fantastically success, fantastic success at, um, de at detecting hundreds and thousands of planets around other stars. But in addition, the data is useful for studying uh, galaxies. This is the light curve, it's called, of, um, of a, a galaxy. It's not a well-known galaxy. Uh, again, the, the horizontal axis is time, so you see um, the axis isn't well labeled. It's labeled in uh, ten thousands of. of um, actually, I forget um, the, the exact uh, unit of time, but this is over um, uh, about a year's worth of time total, showing the brightness of this galaxy as a function of time. And the amazing thing is that this galaxy is not constant, and it's not just changing by a little bit. It's not like there's a little something going on in the out, outreaches of the galaxy or anything. There's something fundamentally is changing. The, the, um, the, the zero of, of flux is, is, is below the bottom of this plot, but you can see uh, based on the scale that these changes are not a small fraction of the total brightness of the galaxy. So it's, it, it's highly variable. It's, it's variable in a random way that's it's still not completely understood why why is the variation so random? It's, it's probably having to do with some sort of uh, inflow of matter onto the central uh, black hole of this galaxy so that uh, clouds of matter fall randomly into the black hole. And as they fall in, they get uh, heated up because of the extreme gravitational forces and uh, produce uh, bright radiation. Um, here's another... Um, plot that's maybe a little hard to see. This is showing a similar thing for two different galaxies, showing the variation over time. The, the horizontal axes here are labeled, uh, are days in, in time, uh, sorry, time in days. And the, um, the black points are the, um, the brightness of the object in uh, gamma rays. This is data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. And um, it shows that not only at, at optical wavelengths, but at, at um, this high energy gamma ray uh, wavelengths, uh, galaxies are highly variable. And um, I, I've done a lot of work trying to understand the, um, the nature of the variation and developing analysis techniques to, uh, to do that. But to a large extent, um, while there are various uh, alternative alternative models and and theories about how this kind of variation uh, goes on. It's not completely understood by any means. Um, in a way, one of the most dynamic things that ever happens in the universe is is what's called a gamma ray burst. And I I found this this nice slide on the on the internet because it shows that. Even a child can can understand how bright a gamma ray burst is. 
Um, this is a, a, a comparison where you start off with the uh, brightness of a light bulb is, is something that's well known. And a campfire, it, it, roughly speaking, if you calculate how much radiation comes out, it's a, roughly 100 times that of a light bulb. A nuclear power plant, in turn, is 10,000 campfires. The sun is 100 million billion nuclear power plants, and so on and so on. A supernova, like the Crab Nebula supernova that we talked about, is 100 million suns, 100 million stars like, like the sun. And in turn, gamma ray bursts are a thousand billion times as bright as a supernova. So even though, I mean, um, this is called, this is exponential growth um, in its extreme. And it, if you're familiar with how exponential growth goes, it, it only a few factors, only a few iterations of some factor give you a, an enormous increase, but it's a way for feeling how bright well, what is a gamma ray burst? It's it, it's largely unknown, but it's a sudden flash of gamma rays. I'll show some of these light curves in a minute. But it's as this slide hints at, it's incredibly bright. It, um, gamma ray bursts are brighter than everything else in the universe put together in all wavelengths, even though what we're seeing is only um, a gamma ray radiation. So it's, it's a stupendously bright thing. It's, it's almost impossible to conceive of how bright. Um, based on that comment, you think the, the total energy involved would be stupendous. It, it, it is, but the only reason why gamma ray bursts don't dominate everything in the universe is because they only last for a short period of time. Uh, some of them are only bright for a few uh, tens of milliseconds, a fraction of a second. Others last for hundreds of seconds. But they die. They die away. They're, and once they're, they die away, they're gone forever. So the total amount of radiation emitted is not as big as it would be if they continued. But while they're on, they're brighter than everything else in the universe. And so we're trying to understand what they are by by studying their light curves. And uh, this this is a little technical, but I want to underscore what it takes to get raw data, the, what the, this, is, um, this is gamma ray data from an old NASA um, um, uh, observatory. Um, and the raw data consists of the time at which individual gamma ray photons arrive. Get light, of, light is, as you, you may know, consists of little particles of, of energy called photons. And each photon could be measured, at, in, especially at gamma rays, where the energies are, are strong enough so you can measure the time. And so this, this list of numbers in the left-hand column, which, it, which extends, which would extend hundreds of, of feet, if I showed the whole thing, is simply the arrival times in units of microseconds, that is millions of a second for individual photons. Well, a list like that is almost meaningless. Um, to your eye. So in order to um, make sense out of the variation, you, the, the idea is to, to histogram the, these times, that is make a, a bar chart or a histogram. Um, many of you may be familiar with histograms in, in other situations. They're in the newspapers all the time for economic data and so on. But this, this plot shows how the appearance of this histogram or attempt at studying the brightness of the gamma ray burst as a function of time, how much that depends on the size of the bins. Um, these four, di the four different charts that you see are four different choices for how big the bins are. And, if you, and um, so what's the right, the right answer? Well, the, some of the techniques that I, I mentioned earlier, and in particular something called Bayesian blocks is a way of of answering the question, how many is the right number of bins and how big should the bins be? The inset at the lower right shows uh, the, the detailed uh, light curve or, or plot of gamma ray flux versus time that comes out of this, this so-called Bayesian block analysis, which is really an objective way of determining how to do the histogramming of the, the times. And I, I, I go into this in a little more detail than 
maybe I should for this this um, basic tour, just because I, I think this tool is useful in a lot of other areas of science and and engineering, where you um, want to collect together uh, data, not necessarily just data as a function of time, but it's functions of other things and can make sense out of it. And here's here's the final result for um, the details of a, um, a gamma ray burst. Uh, again, flux versus time. And the green histogram is just an arbitrary uh, histogram with a very narrow bin choice um, for comparison. And the blue and red plots are this objective uh, structural analysis that comes out of the, uh, the Bayesian block analysis. Well, I want to kind of finish up with a very dramatic um, thing. The, um, the, the, this is, um, it's a new way of getting uh, information from the universe. I mentioned that all the way from radio waves to high energy uh, gamma rays is, is is electromagnetic radiation with different wavelengths. I didn't say it in those terms, but it's really all the same thing. Gravitational waves are a new kind of, of information source that comes from the universe. Um, it, it, it's a little bit hard to, to get an intuitive picture, but they are sometimes called wiggles in space time. Um, and, and LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory which um, is, was constructed to try to observe these little tiny wiggles in, uh, in space time that might come from uh, two black holes merging together to form one black hole in, in simple terms. And in fact, it was enormously successful as, as many of you know. Um, I, I like to point out that, there, that the success of LIGO was really based on the a number of things which were almost impossible to happen. Um, I, I love this quote from uh, Through the Looking Glass. Uh, Einstein himself, when he predicted gravitational waves, was not 100% sure that his physics predicted that they really exist. And there was debate over the decades as to whether, just based on physical theory, whether gravitational waves exist. Even if they did, it wasn't known for sure, are there any astrophysical sources strong enough to generate them? Um, the technology to measure strains is, uh, the strain is, the, is the, the thing that you measure when the, this gravitational waves go by. There's an incredibly tiny strains and the technology to measure them is a, was a, a big unknown and it, it took um, hundreds of scientists dedicating many, many years. So anyway, in addition to the impossible things that scientists devoting that much time, sorry, to that, to this project. And the fact that NSF, the National Science Foundation in the US funded this high risk project to the tune of $1.1 billion is sort of a miracle. And finally, from the point of view of a data analyst, uh, it really was not known ahead of time that the very weak signals that were expected could ever be fished out of the huge noise. The, um, the, the, the noise background by um, little tiny earthquakes that jiggle the detector around and, and, and mimic um, the signal you're looking for are, are very much uh, very, very big and hard to deal with. But it all worked out. You may have seen these plots showing the, um, again, these, these are not light curves. These are, what do you call them? They're, strain curves, or uh, they're analogous to sound curves, but they're really the strain of space-time um, and, and the predictions and the um, observations um, agreed with each other. And it's a really remarkable thing, which I wish I had more time to talk about. But let me finish up by just showing one final um, animation. This is a computer animation, obviously, showing two black holes in orbit around each other. Um, generating the, the yellow and blue are meant to show these gravitational waves, these wiggles in space time that the, the black holes um, uh, generate. Well, there are a few more things I wanted to show, a few more technical things about gravitational waves. And let me just finish with, this is a bit risky because this is showing, this is not, um, my work at all. This is a paper that just appeared a few days ago on the, um, from a group in China, where they where they plot the brightness of a 
uh, a galaxy as a function of time. And they're postulating that what's happening here is that the, the brightness of this galaxy is due to a pair of black holes in orbit around each other in much the same way I showed a minute ago and much the same way is happening at the center of our galaxy. But the, or sorry, our, our, we don't have a pair, we just have one uh, black hole in, in our, in the Milky Way. But these, these pairs of black holes end up merging together um, as they get closer and closer, the, the oscillations get more and more frequent. And so but by looking at this data as a function of time, they make a prediction and here's just a, a um, technical plot showing their prediction that the, the two black holes that are, are not known for sure to be there at all, but if this data is correct, uh, these two black holes will emerge, uh, will merge together to a single black hole sometime in the next couple of years. And if that prediction comes true, that'll be really stunning. Okay, well, um, I, I've, I've run longer than I intended to because I'd really like to, to hear your question. So let, let me stop there and, um, and uh, take questions. Right, so there's uh, applause in the room here. Um, that is a, a stunning tour. Um, I'm going to first of all look for questions in the chat channel. Yes. And. Okay, yeah, I'm looking at them myself and I see some, some more, some comments about um, things that I, I really uh, explained. Um, yeah, I see someone like the um, Gamma Ray a movie of the Crab Nebula, which I, I, I thought. I thought was really stunning myself. Um, and I guess the question is, um, uh, what about the jets? Well, yes, uh, jets in, in general, um, you see jets in, um, in the supernova remnants and in galaxies too. And uh, that's a long, a long story, but basically a rotating object, it uh, turns out there are ways that through magnetic fields and electric uh, fields and so on can generate just the material that stream out along the rotational pole of the um, of whatever it is the rotate that's rotating. In the case of pulsars, the rotating neutron star or the rotating black hole can generate uh, jets that are aligned with the uh, the pole, the rotational pole. Um, yeah, there's this huge dog leg in there. Um, let's let's see. Um, Maybe, maybe let me try to go back and. Uh, and, and the, the picture you use to publicize it um, shows it really clearly. Let's see. Um, is this this thing here? This yeah, thing? that's right. You mean um, at the lower left? To the left, so uh, south, west, south, uh, east, southwest. There, and yes. About about a, a feature in one of the rings, which must be a coincidence. The jet bends through thirty degrees. Right. The momentum transfer must be enormous. Yes. Well, this whole region is filled with a a, a magnetic field that is not completely uniform. So, the magnetic field um, certainly curves along. Um, along that line. But basically that the jet that you're referring to is, is aligned with where we think the rotational pole of the um, neutron star is. And it sends out a jet in both directions. It's kind of confused in the upper right because of all the other stuff going on there. In the lower left, you see it better and it curves around because the magnetic field is, is curved around. That would, that would be the best. Um, Guess it. And what's going on. Well, thanks. Thanks for that question. There. Um, let's see. Thank it, you. It would probably help if if you are not asking a question. Um, if you keep yourselves on mute, because there's some interference coming through. Um, right. 
Um, Jeff, are you taking these questions in the chat channel in a particular order then? Or uh, No, I was just scanning them. Why don't we do this? If there are any questions from people in the room, why don't you try to field those? Um, right, okay. Um, any questions in the room? Raise your hand. No, we don't have any questions in the room at the moment. Okay, well then let me, um, let's see, there's a question that um, Deepali Gaskell asked about whether the um, the Earth's atmosphere could could uh, cause any of the optical variability. And, and basically everything I showed, um, if they were from the ground, the things from, from Kepler, of course, were from space, where our own atmosphere doesn't matter, but from the, from the ground, um, effects of the Earth's atmosphere are always um, uh, taken out when the, the data are shown. It's, it, um, it's not always perfect, of course, and it, it gives rise to some uncertainty, but... Um, okay, here's a good question. Uh, but I guess this is Bob um, about the um, isotropic versus beam radiation. That's a great question. Um, the, the, let me try to explain the, the question. We know a lot about how much is the total energy coming out of the gamma ray burst um, that, that in the sense of what arrives in our direction and is um, captured by our gamma ray detectors. But that could be much, it could be a smaller, well, it could, it could be a very large amount if that same amount of energy was, was emitted in all directions. That is if the emission were isotropic so we would be seeing a tiny fraction, maybe one uh, ten thousandth of the total amount emitted by the gamma ray burst. Uh, but if if the radiation is beamed in a narrow beam, which it most likely is, then um, that's a, that's a different way of, of estimating the, the total amount. And I, I must say, my statement that gamma ray bursts are brighter than everything else in the universe combined in all wavelengths is based on the assumption that they emit isotropically. Um, so it's a bit of a cheat because we don't know that for sure. In fact, it's it's almost sure that that the radiation is is strongly beamed. So the the total am amount of radiation is, is is less than that estimate, but it still is a stupendous amount. Well, thanks, Jeff. I was just trying to find out what the, what the current status of that argument is because I've not looked uh, at it for a long time, but. <laughs> Yeah, I have, maybe you know more than I. I haven't worked in that field for quite a while, but I think more and more the theoretical models certainly are based on uh, um, narrowly collimated um, um, jets, and in fact that the the variability, the random variability in the light in the gamma ray light curves that I showed is due to um, uh, shock waves within those jets interfering with each other, and so the all of the radiation is pretty much um, beamed, much like the, in a pulsar, the, the, the radio radiation is beamed. But uh, to be more quantitative than that, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know the current status. Well, you look at the next question then. Maybe gamma ray bursts are due to collimated exhaust radiation from alien spacecraft. Well, I'll just get that one and go ahead to um, how frequent are these bursts and have anybody been, have any been seen recently? Yes, uh, gamma ray bursts are um, basically, um, let's see how to say it. Um, they're, they're very common. I, I, um, I was trying to dig out some, some numbers. Uh, Bob, maybe you, you, you know, know the numbers for, but basically um, I think one a day, every, somewhere in the universe, um, one a day happens. And then that's about, um, <laughs> we have to correct for some that we, that we, we don't see and, and things like that, but um, they're, they're very common. Oh, right, uh, and Jeff, we've got a question in the room now. We're trying to put him on the micro the roving microphone. Well, okay. Thank you very much. A very interesting lecture, and I'm humbled by the... Can you speak more into the microphone, if possible? Right. My question is, 
do you believe that Homo sapiens will tame these enormous energetic resources at any time? Is that Can you, you repeat the, the question? I didn't. I couldn't quite. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Do, do you think that Homo sapiens will tame these enormous energies at any time? Is that? That is my question. Yes. Well, um, <laughs> prediction is difficult, especially of the future. Um, <laughs> um, that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, um, I don't. I, of course, I don't know. I think it's it's going to be a long time um, for for the technology for that. Um, let, let me sort of deflect the question a little bit, and and maybe. Um, partially answer the question about alien uh, spacecraft. There, there's an interesting idea about tapping energy to send signals, tapping astrophysical energy to send uh, signals to other civilizations. And it, the idea is it's called star tickling. Um, a, and a physicist named Tony, Tony Z, I think was the first to think of it. But and the notion is as follow, follows. It, one of the difficult problems that the SETI program has faced is that is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. How can, how can a civilization generate enough power in radio uh, transmissions to reach across um, interstellar space? Uh, it's a difficult problem, but suppose you let a star do that for you. you the civilization is near a, a variable star, for, in particular a Cepheid variable star, and it somehow can fi figure out a, a way of sending a little beam of energy into the star to change its its behavior into the Cepheid variable. Uh, Cepheid variable stars are basically unstable. But that's why they're they're variable, and so a little tiny change in the way of energy injected to the core of a Cepheid variable might cause its peak brightness to, to change by a little bit in time. It could delay or advance the, the, the peak brightness. And so in this way, a civilization could, by ejecting a, a low energy beam into a nearby Cepheid variable, could use it as like a Morse code uh, telegraph key and send a message by um, a, zeros and ones advance or uh, um, or um, delay a um, peak of a Cepheid variable star. And that would, even that would require um, gener um, making use of a huge amount of energy. And um, my personal opinion is that most civilizations will run into problems, existential problems before they developed the ability to um, to utilize Thank you. Very it. Much, sir. Thank you. Right. Um, if I could ask a question, um, sure. uh, how are gamma ray bursts detected? I mean, I imagine you you need them to ionize something, but I realize that I have no idea how this is done. I probably speak for other people in the audience. Well, the the, the um, detectors, the early detectors were uh, blocks of. Um, materials, sodium iodide, I think, was the material. And the, um, the, the gamma ray photons essentially ionize or, you know, leave tracks or perturb the, the, um, the detectors and, and the signal can be read out. Uh, that technology has advanced a lot. And, and for, for gamma rays, for example, they're very sophisticated um, tracking devices. But in a simple way, it's it's along the lines you suggested. It's um, you don't detect them in the same way as ordinary photons, but you you look at their the effect of the energy that they dissipate inside the detector. And and um, in the case of um, gamma rays, especially, you can track the direction in which the photon comes uh, fairly crudely, but and get a, a good idea that the direction that the um, the photon is good. Right. Uh, so, now, can I suggest going to Charles Draper's question in the chat channel? Yes, yeah, so I was just looking at that. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, presumably. 
Um, oh, yeah, let me try to rephrase the question. I, at the very end, I showed a, a new um, prediction that if the this um, data analysis of a apparently um, changing signal over time is really a, a black hole binary about to merge, um, people, I guess maybe the the question to be asked is what what do you expect to see? Um, it's a little hard to say, but presume the if the radiation you see is somehow due to the black holes um, themselves, then when they and, and due to the um, the orbital motion of the black holes, then when they merge, there's no longer this orbital motion, so the radiation would simply disappear. But on the other hand, there's probably other radiation coming from around the system that isn't connected with the orbital motion. So I, I haven't read the paper enough to know exactly what uh, what they predict will happen. Whether it's accepted or not, I, I can't say. It's so new, it, ha it hasn't even been cited yet um, on any of the, the um, archival uh, literature. You may know the archive is a very rapid internet thing for responding to other papers. And last I checked, there was no citations yet. And in fact, as um, as we speak, as when I'm done with this um, presentation, I'm joining a, a little um, discussion group at Stanford, some theor theorists at Stanford who are gonna discuss this very um, paper and see. I'll see what they think. So um, and Freeman Dyson, I, Freeman Dyson, um, yeah, gamma ray bursts um, oh. are um, in a completely different regime from uh, solar systems and uh, stellar systems. If 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 one gam if a gamma ray burst happened near the solar system, we wouldn't be around to uh, to say much about it. Um, okay. Um, going back in the chat channel, we have from Deepali a question about whether we're likely to be blinded by gamma ray bursts. I mean, that's an interesting question to my mind, because um, it, might, it could have had an effect on the evolution of life if we'd been in the neighborhood of a gamma ray burst in the past, I suppose. Do you, or are they in, in just too rare for that to be a possibility? Um, it, it's the, it, the, They are, they occur often, but in the not not near um, a given point in space, the universe is a big place. So, even though there's one a day somewhere in the universe, the chances of finding one near us are are tiny. Hopefully, and the reason why we're here is there haven't there hasn't been one. Um, we wouldn't it wouldn't be blinding as such, even if one happened nearby, because the um, gamma rays don't make it through the atmosphere. But what could ha what would happen if it was close enough is the atmosphere would be heated up and and bo boil away, or at the very least the um, the half of the of the Earth facing away from the burst would be okay, but the half of the Earth facing toward the gamma ray burst would be in in big trouble. So I'm sure there's a, a seed for a science fiction story based on exactly one half of the Earth being wiped out and the other half surviving but um see the point is they're so they're so quick that it it's a it's like a flash that that comes and goes in a in a second or so and its effect would um be only on the on the part of the earth facing toward the the event but. right we seem to be uh, coming to the end of questions now no, no more questions in the room well, in that case, um... I'm sorry, can I have just one more question, please? Okay, please go ahead. Uh, it goes back right to the beginning where uh, <clears throat> you were showing these NK gap charts. Um, yes. So uh, my question is, if you go back to that um, slide, which you were showing uh, right at the beginning, the NK gap before that. Yes. Before. Yeah, this one here. Um, if you look at the top left um, image, um, in the in the white bands, you have these black spots at very regular intervals. Uh, and I was wondering what they were. 
Oh, those are uh, fiducial marks um, that the camera imposes on the images to- I see. Yeah, I was just wondering whether they were astral objects. No, they're reg registration marks. Um, okay. Good, good eye. It's um, <laughs> easy. Thank you. No, I was, I was, I was wondering because I was wondering whether the uh, they were astral objects and very precisely placed. No, that would be remarkable, and <laughs> but it, it's it's good in this particular one because it it helps you uh, visualize that the thing is shown at an angle because you see those the, the dots are kind of distorted by the the angle, but you see yeah. that. There are very nice subtle features outside of this gap. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these other rings um, are, are really neat. As, as you may know, the, the Voyager images of the um, Saturn's rings are just stupendous. They show incredible detail and, and all kinds of fantastic um, features. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, there's so much more to uh, observe, isn't there? I mean, we we have observed a lot of the universe, but there's still so much more to be to be to be uncovered. Um, absolutely, that's I was hoping to get across that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the things that are are we're now finding are indirect. Like when well, you don't see gravitational waves, you have to build a, a billion dollar detector uh, to find them. Um, you don't see. Um, you don't even see images coming from a rover. I mean, you don't see the surface of Mars, you see images sent back from a rover on Mars. So astronomy is becoming less and less hands-on, direct and more and more kind of remote sensing, but um, that's just the, that's the nature of the beast. Um, can I just make one, one comment, very quick one? Sure. It's more a comment actually, well, um, a comment that I mean, I'd love to hear your your uh, your your response to that. <clears throat> I am from India, and you know, culturally, we we um, we we grew up with the idea of understanding the universe. That's part of the culture. And with regard to seeing gravitational waves, uh, what we know is that there's this sound om om, which is the background hum of the universe. So I'm just thinking that's a sound wave. So that's one of the ways which we perceive uh, gravitation. Um, but perhaps there might be a light wave of a photon effect, which may allow us to actually use our eyes to detect gravitational waves because um, we detect gravitation through other sensory mechanisms, other sensory, uh, 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 other, uh, other uh, means of perception. Yes, well, that's a... Am I making any sense? Yes, unfortunately, what I think you have, have heard, li literally, are not the gravitational waves, but a simply simple um, translation of the signals, the, the strain variations uh, converted to a sound. Yes, um, the sound reflects the magnetic, magnetic uh, fields that are prevalent in the, in the whole of the universe. Well, it, it reflects. It's a star. In fact, I, I didn't use the word uh, the word, but the 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 signals from the merging black hole that I showed you. Um, in fact, I might as well try to to, to show it. Um, it's called a chirp signal. Um, for um, yes, here we go. Yes, these are called chirp signals. Uh -huh. These are raw signals from the LIGO. And what happens, the, the black holes are, and, and in the, the, um, the video of the theory showed the same thing. As the two black holes get closer and closer, um, their orbital period decreases, they, the frequency increases. So this, if you converted this signal to a sound, a sound yeah. it would be like a bird chirping. And what you have, have heard, I think, were simulations of a background of gravitational radiation from other sources, which would be like a, a hum. Yeah. But it's not, um, it's, it's a sound only through a conversion from the, the um, space-time strain signal to a sound wave. It's not a direct, but I mean, you, 
I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but it, it's not like you could ever hear a gravitational wave directly. You'd, you'd have to have it translated by a computer process to, to be um, simple-minded about it. You have to take the, this, this, pretend that this is an audio signal and it becomes a, a bird chirping. That's, that's what's going on. I hope that makes sense. Well, yeah, it's-, it's I, think, I think we'll frequency. leave it. We'll leave it there. Um, and normally I'd like to pick up some feature of a, of a lecture and, uh, uh, and comment on how good it was. But this tour was, I mean, a, a brilliant tour through, through the dynamic universe, uh, right from Earth, right out to the uh, remotest gamma ray burst. So uh, I can't pick any one part of it. I also really appreciate the uh, glimpses into your research. Glim glimpses, obviously, uh, all they were, because there's a lot of mathematics involved, and uh, it's uh, not possible for us to understand all that at the moment. But um, this is a, a really, really uh, great lecture. We really enjoyed it. And if the audience would like to um, unmute and give some applause, let's uh, let's do that. <laughs> Thank you. Bravo. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. We'll, I'll close the meeting now.